You remember when you were a little kid, how you just loved to find a secret little cubby hole or hiding place where you could get away and just enjoy being quiet and alone? Kids just seem to love to do this, whether it's a tree house or uh, a, a cardboard bo large cardboard box that's been made into a little hiding place or even a blanket draped over a rope. I remember when I was a kid, we had a big swamp out behind our house, so we used to go through the swamp and make trails, and I would take the uh, pallets that my dad had from his business and make four sides and a, and a ceiling and fill in the, the little gaps with stuffing, and oh, it was a great place to go in and just be alone, just be quiet, just have that place where nobody else was there, it was just for me. You see, right now we live in a very fast-paced world with much demands on our time and energy and focus and very little time to be alone with God. Sometimes we really haven't been spending that time with him. We haven't been finding that quiet time. I think one of the greatest examples of the importance of having a place to be alone with God is in the story in the movie called The War Room. It's about a lady, a little uh, black lady from the South who, who had this room where she just went, it was a closet, and she would go in that and she would pray for her family, her friends, for anybody in need. And dynamic things began to happen in their lives. God began to change things. It was in her secret place of prayer where she went to prayer, pray and plead with God for his leading. If you haven't seen it, I suggest you do. It'll change your life. It'll impact your prayer life in a big way. Jesus told his disciples it was really important to have a, a secret place. In Matthew 6, 6, he said, but when you pray, go into your room. Some translations say closet. And when you have shut your door, pray to the Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. This secret place is where we get to know God and commune with him in prayer. That prayer closet can be anywhere. It can be that time when you're just alone with your thoughts. Uh, maybe you're out in the woods or you're in on a long walk or just you have a place in your house where you can be alone. Some people even pray while they're driving. Of course, they keep their eyes open, but that's a time when no one else is talking to them. Whatever it is, God wants us to make sure that we spend that time with him. Jesus often went up to the mountains to pray. It was his, it was his private time, his secret place to be alone with God. Today's sermon is based on Psalm 91, and it's about finding your secret place. Psalm 91 is the most quoted psalm outside of the 23rd Psalm. Now, we, Psalm 23, we, we understand quite well. We don't even know who was the author of Psalm 91 because it's not listed. But whatever it was, whoever it was, they may paint a remarkable picture of making God our dwelling place. Let's take a look what the Bible is telling us. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Now, the allusion to the cloud here, the, the allusion to the shadow was to being under the cloud that was referred to when the children of Israel were in the wilderness. It represented God's protection over his people. It was God making sure that his presence and his power and his protection was with them at all times. But in this verse, the psalmist is admonishing us to dwell in the secret place of the Most High, not just to visit there occasionally, but to dwell. Now, the Hebrew word for dwell is yahab. It means to dwell, to sit, or to remain. Now, in our frantic lives that we live today, sitting still is considered unproductive. 
but in the spirit life of the Christian, sitting and remaining in God's presence is being in the communal fellowship with him. It is a treasure that nothing else on this earth can match. The scripture tells us, be still and know that I am God. So our dwelling place is not just a place we visit. It's a place we live. It's our home. And this is what's being admonished here. Now, David, make, uh, in Psalm 27, verses 4 and 5, gives us some further insight into what it's like. He says, One thing I have desired of the Lord, and that will I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me and he shall set me high up on a rock. Now, the Bible tells us that the way to God is in the sanctuary. And indeed, it is a type of the progress of how we get to know God. It deals with our being justified, sanctified, and ultimately glorified. But in the days of King David, when this psalm was written, there was a very special secret place where a person could really be alone with God. And very few ever found that place or were ever able to enter in. For it was called the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle or the temple. It was a place where man would, the, the people would symbolically go to meet their God. And the word for God was El Shaddai, God Almighty. The all-sufficient one, El Shaddai, came and dwelt among him. The Bible says his Shekinah glory came and filled the temple. It first came and was in the sanctuary. Later, when the permanent temple was built, it was the awareness that God was present with them. But before that happened, in the, when they were still in the wilderness, they had a little... Uh, and they hadn't quite built it yet. They had a side, uh, a permanent uh, sanctuary. They had a little side place where they would go. Moses always went there, and the Bible says the Shekinah glory of God was there. A very interesting story is found in Corinthians where Joshua, the Bible tells us Joshua went there and he spent even more time than Moses in the presence of the Lord. Joshua's name in Hebrew is Yeshua, the very same name for Jesus in the Old Testament. Joshua became a type of Jesus. God chose Joshua to take his people from the wilderness into the promised land. Even Moses wasn't given that privilege. Joshua was being pre prepared by being in the presence of the Almighty God, El Shaddai, in His Shekinah glory. In the days that followed, only the priests were able to go in. But David had insight when he wrote these texts that said he knew that the spiritual lesson was for each one of us to enter in to the Spirit with the Father. He wasn't just talking about the physical walking in the sanctuary because you see God is spirit and he dwells in our hearts and minds. David knew that in searching for God, he would find the peace and presence and power of God. In verse 2, we find it, he says, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in him. I will trust. He trusted in the Mighty One, the El Shaddai, for his safety, his security, his protection because of God's power.
When we enter into that secret place, we get connected with God. And Jesus comes into our hearts and the Spirit fills us and it enables us to live through the power of God. He wants to change each one of us. He wants to make our lives holy by his presence. It only happens by faith, not by us trying harder. We must believe that he is at work. And he has promised that he will come and live and dwell within each one of us. What is this secret place of God? It, folks, it is the very heart of God himself. It is the center of his love, his mercy, his grace, and his will. It is this place where we are brought by the power of the Holy Spirit and through the blood of Jesus. And no one can enter except through the blood of Jesus. None of us can feel the perfect love of God. And no one can comprehend his richness and grace. And no one can know the very heart of God until we come to that secret place in Jesus. He is the one who lived intimately with the Father. And he asks us to accept his life by faith. You see, he wants us to come in and sit and remain with him in order that our exposure to him can fill us and change us, change our minds, change our wills, change our emotions, and ultimately change our actions. You see, if we're not born of the Spirit, we cannot hope to have this change take place because sin separates us from God. And Jesus is the one who comes in and takes sin away. It is his presence in our life that takes out the sin. None of us can fix ourselves. Only he can. That's why he said, he works in us to will and to do his good pleasure. But there are great blessings in that secret place that come from God. There are many deeper experiences that we could never have on our own. God has called us to deliver us from the fowler. And that term fowler represents a hunter or a trapper of birds, specifically wild birds. The way hunters would work is they would put out a little piece of bait that would entice their, the particular animal that they were trying to trap. And then when they came sniffing around, the snare would grab them. That's the same way Satan works. He tries to ensnare us with things that appeal to our natural human desires. And then we're caught off guard and entrapped by him. But there's a wonderful promise here in God's word. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the precious, perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You will not be afraid of the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor the destruction that lays waste at noonday. You see, David knew what it, was meant, what it meant to be hunted because Saul was chasing him, trying to kill him, trying to destroy him. And he knew that his protection came from God. It didn't come from any other source. Just like an eagle protects her young, or a hand protects her chicks, so God's word and God's presence and God's power protects us from the attacks of the fowler. Anyone who lives in Christ will know his power to change, his power to protect us from the evil one. Unfortunately, those that don't believe don't have that protection. And verses uh, 7 and following are describing what will happen at the end when, those, when great tribulation comes upon the earth, because the Bible does predict that it will. Uh, Daniel tells us in chapter 12 that there's a great time of trouble coming. And Jesus confirmed it in Matthew 24 where he said, a great time such as never was or never will be. 
Even David talked about the, the tr that God is going to be there for us in times of trouble. So the point for each one of us, our protection is not in our own ability to save ourselves. Our protection is in God, in his spirit presence in our lives. Notice what it says in verses 7 and 8. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. Only will your eyes will you look and see the reward of the wicked. You see, the reward of the wicked is they're reaping what they sown. They haven't sown a life hidden in El Shaddai, the God who will protect, protect them. So God is telling us to enter into that quiet place to know him and we will be protected in, when difficult, difficult times come. Now the Bible doesn't leave us alone with illustrations of how God guides and protects. The whole story of the children of Israel from the time they left Egypt to the time they got to the promised land was a type of how God wants to take care of our needs. And you know every one of those ten plagues that came on Egypt was attacking a god of the Egyptians. The god of Israel was showing he was more powerful than they. Whether it was flies, frogs, lice, or whatever, God delivered his people. And in the deserts, when they couldn't take care of themselves, he provided the water, the food, the covering, the warmth, their clothes didn't wear out. God was their protector. When they got to the promised land, he was the one that destroyed the cities, not they themselves. The lesson for us is to know that God is our provider and protector. Paul confirms this in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians 10, when he speaks of, of the experience of the Israelites. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Do you believe that we're approaching the end of the age? It sure looks that way, doesn't it? Therefore let him who thinks he stand takes heed lest he fall. No temptation has overcome you except as is common to man. But God is faithful. He who will not allow you be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. He didn't say we wouldn't have temptations and trials and problems. But he said he would take us through these problems. He would deliver us. And verses 9 and 10 says, Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall you befall, befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. Remember, this is in the context of the reward of the wicked, those who are separated from God. But those who are in God, who dwell in his secret place, will be protected. God is stronger than all the problems. It is true we will face challenges. It is true that sin affects every one of us on this earth. We are harassed by temptations. We experience the results of sin on the earth that affects us all. And at the same time, God uses challenges like these to chastise us, to mature us, not as punishment, but as discipline that we might know how to trust him even deeper. For those who dwell in the secret place, God will take us through. No matter what comes, God will work it for good to teach us to trust him more. Verse 11 says, For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Have you ever seen an angel? I don't know. Not very many people have. But some people are sure that an angel is intervened on their behalf. I think of my young niece, Amy, who was coming down the mountain on a bicycle in Tahoe last year, going 40 miles an hour. And a guy with a 
pulling a trailer cut right in front of her, no chance to stop. She crashed in the back of it. The, the wheels went over, breaking both of her legs. She said, Mama, I saw my angel. He was there, and he saved my life. Now, not every one of us are going to see an angel, but the promise is that God's angels are there. The Bible tells us his angels will watch over us, and I believe they will. So Christians have testified that God is with them in many times. God isn't going to deliver us from problems, but he's going to take us through. He's going to be there to help us. He's going to be there to bless us. And we're told that those who dwell in Jesus are going to be delivered when the great troubles and difficulties come at the end of time. <clears throat> Psalm 91, 14 to 16, he closes, because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. And remember that name is El Shaddai, the almighty God who is going to meet our needs. He shall call upon him and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and I will show him my salvation. That's God's promise to you. Do you want to make God your protector, your El Shaddai, the one who meets your needs? God doesn't ignore our prayers, but you know, some people think because their prayers aren't answered that he's not listening because maybe the answer didn't come how they wanted it or it didn't come quickly enough. And they, so, so they give up and they quit praying. Sometimes it's hard work getting into that secret place of God. Sometimes we have to keep knocking, keep seeking, keep asking, but know this, God hears your cry. And he's promised to answer. God's pro promises deliverances. He promises a long life. He promises salvation for any who dwell in that secret place with him. And he will deliver us from all the tactics of Satan. He will give us every blessing that we can receive in the power and presence of Jesus Christ in our hearts and minds. We may suffer in this life because that does happen. Sometimes we're led into scary places where we have to place our full faith in him. Being a disciple or a follower of Jesus does not is not the place of safety as the world defines safety, but it is nevertheless the safest place we can be. When you're with God, nothing can separate you from him. Romans tells us nothing can separate us from the love of God, not even death itself, because God is whole purpose is to redeem us, to restore us, so my appeal to you today is to draw near to El Shaddai, our God, in prayer. Dedicate your life completely to him. Search for your secret place where you can be alone with him. There is no better place for you to be than to be in the heart of God, dwelling in his awesome presence, guided by his Holy Spirit, feeling his anointing and walking in his will. Find that secret place in God and let God live in you. There's always room for more in the heart of God. It is his secret place. May God bless you as you spend time with him.